Good day and welcome to the Thomas Henley YouTube channel with your host, Mr. Thomas Henley, of course. And today we're going to be speaking about autism and depression. How it may be different for us when compared to the average person. We're going to have a look at some of the stats, have a look at generally how depression can best be characterized. And I'm going to be using my own personal history, my own personal experiences of about 14 years of living with clinical depression and anxiety, as well as mix matching it with different aspects of the psychological and biomedical sciences literature. But let's have a look at our first slide here. Now, I do want to highlight that the stats, the prevalences of depression among autistic people varies a lot study to study, depending on where that study is done. We're going to focus here today on the Autistica article which is a company in the UK who does a lot of research related studies around autism. They showed that around 79% of autistic people have a mental illness. Many don't seek the support and more than 50% of autistic people have had depression at some point in their life. It gets even more worrying sadly as autistic people are nine times more likely to consider SUI than the general population. And I've even seen some studies looking at childhood experiences of this, this statistic, and it's equally as troubling. But now that we've got these stats out of the way, let's have a look at depression in a nutshell. It affects around one in six people in the United States, America. It's characterized by a persistent low mood. But I do want to highlight that the feeling of sadness in my experience is very different from the the dull sort of anhedonic feeling that you get with depression it's it's very different sadness is very cathartic and useful and kind of helps you process things to be diagnosed with clinical depression the person has to be meeting a certain amount of symptoms for at least two plus weeks and these can include things like sleep issues loss of interest in activities that would once give them joy, things like appetite changes, as well as a lot of worse, worthless feelings. There's this concept called learnt helplessness, which is very prevalent among depressed individuals. It's basically this idea that you sort of learn from your own experiences, whether it be painful experiences that you've had or sort of long-term anxiety, that there is no way of sort of escaping or no way of fixing things. There's also persistent depressive disorder or what may be described as dysphymia, which is basically a mild to moderate level of depression for about two years, at least two plus years. So it's a very long term thing. You can also get other experiences related to depression, talking about it like it's some kind of <laughs> theatrical joyride. You can have prenatal or postpartum depression, seasonal affective disorders related to like the, the seasons, of course, atypical, which can have aspects of mood reactivity, which may be a di bit different. And also you have bipolar disorder, which is a combination of different depressive states at varying degrees and also mania, sort of kind of like the opposite, sort of this excited kind of high ego kind of experience where people can do a lot of risky things. Generally, people with bipolar depending on what type of bipolar they have, kind of flip between these states of depression and mania. And it can also be characterized as hypomania in, in some of the forms, which is basically like a, like a lower sort of experience of mania. We're not focusing specifically on this prenatal, postpartum, SAD, atypical bipolar stuff. We're going to be focusing on the plain old boring clinical depression. So let's have a look at how depression starts. Well, there is no single cause for depression. It can be triggered by a lot of life events, which may be considered to be situational depression, sort of an experience that a lot of people can get following uh, the grieving process or perhaps a very significant life change, losing a job. It can also be impacted a lot by childhood experiences. And I've highlighted this in bold because a lot of autistic people do experience a disproportionate amount of bullying isolation and a lot of sensory sort of social overwhelm which kind of jacks up our anxiety but also can contribute somewhat to the development of depression through the HPA axis. Hypothalamus area in the brain, your pituitary gland and your adrenal glands. It's basically this this sort of cortisol-like loop that has been sort of studied in the context of you know how anxiety might influence the the development of depression. It can also be things related to the more psychological factors 
related to sort of particular thinking styles, internal blame, that, that aspect of learned helplessness that I was talking about. But it can also be impacted by medication, some medications that can be a side effect, physical health, and of course genetics. So there's lots of different ways that depression may manifest, and in a lot of cases it's a combination of lots and lots of different things. For me, there is a heavy genetic factor, particularly in my family, as well as my experiences in childhood, anxiety, and a lot of significant sort of life events, which have all sort of compounded and sort of left me with, you know, a very long-standing depressive condition. It can also be caused by other conditions too. Not going to go too much into that, so let us go on to the next slide and talk about some causes for autistic people. As I said, childhood bullying <laughs> can lead to a lot of sort of long-term anxiety, this sort of state of paranoid hypervigilance where, you know, if you're experiencing a lot of bullying, a lot of negative experiences with people, and you don't particularly know how to spot the signs, it kind of feels to a certain degree like these experiences, like you can't isolate when they're going to happen. So you're left in this sort of constant hypervigilant state where you're paranoid about, you know, every interaction that you're having or every person that you see or every noise that you hear could be sort of an indicator of a threat. It can lead to a lot of long-term anxiety, which can sort of get you feeling a little bit learnt, helpless about it, you know. You feel like you don't really have much control over it. It can also be a sense of mistrust and a lot of scarcity. So if you have a lot of neg negative experiences, particularly early on in life, when someone comes along in your life who's kind of good for you and, you know, who isn't like that, which does happen when you kind of get out there in the world as an adult and realise that the school environment's not necessarily representative of real life, you feel almost wanting to attach onto people like that and you get a lot of feelings of scarcity it kind of impacts your ability to socialize to, to make friends you kind of get very anxiously attached to those people and it can be quite hard to trust people and so let people in unmask as as you can imagine loneliness isolation social anxiety all real big contributors i mean loneliness in general can have a lot of negative even physical effects on one's health and it can also exacerbate feelings of depression. I've talked to many people over the years who are very late on in their life, only recently sort of been diagnosed, and they report a lot of feelings of loneliness, quite often being isolated for long periods of time in their life, not really feeling comfortable enough to sort of go out, find people, make friends, make those connections. It can be a real big issue for a lot of autistic people, especially when they're undiagnosed for a large part of their life. It can also be the likelihood of high anxiety, as we talked about the HPA axis, autistic people pretty likely to <laughs> develop anxiety, maybe due to our brain, maybe due to the interaction with ourselves and the social world that we don't really understand that much and perhaps the, the sensory aspects of it, they can all contribute to levels of anxiety. You can think of things such as routines, struggling with change, things of that nature. Sometimes that can come with a level of anxiety because our world is quite, sometimes quite logical and predictable. Makes sense. Job dissatisfaction, really big element here, really, really big element. Autistic people can really struggle when it comes to finding employment, but also finding employment that they're satisfied with, that they feel happy with. Just as with school being a very closed social environment, uh, that bullying, that isolation, exclusion, loneliness can occur in the workplace as well because it's, it's a closed social environment. That can happen. It can also be some, you know, harbour some feelings of resentment or learned helplessness if we don't progress for our career. Although a lot of companies, a lot of people would say that they hire people and they promote people based on merit, quite often there is a heavy social factor involved with that. It's also aspects of burnout. And burnout's an interesting one because the way that burnout, autistic burnout, manifests, because it's different to the burnout that a lot of people talk about in sort of the neuronormative sense for people who aren't autistic, sort of in the workplace, a little bit different to that. And it can mimic, to some degree, aspects of depression. And sometimes it's quite hard to really pick the two apart. Could be exactly the same thing, might just have different causes of why someone gets into that state. Who knows? Burnout isn't. <laughs> autistic burnout is not a diagnosable condition, but it's something that a lot of people within the autistic community, a lot of psychologists sort of within that field, 
talk about a fair bit. As I said, the chronic stress from the sensory and social issues and differences, and also masking. Masking, masking is a, a strange one. Masking is a component of social camouflage that a lot of autistic people do in order to hide being autistic. It doesn't necessarily have to be changing your body language, your facial expressions, the way that you present to people. It could also be related to the strategies that you do to perhaps avoid social interaction or hide aspects of yourself. That whole avoidance kind of strategy was something that I utilized a lot in school. When I got into my early 20s, I started to mask a lot more. I did socialize a lot more, but I masked very, very heavily. Nowadays, I'm pretty much unmasked in terms of autism. And masking can have a lot of negative impacts. It can exponentially increase the amount of energy demand on social interactions, ignite some feelings of sort of paranoia, trying to understand all the indirect communication, trying to monitor your own facial expressions, body language, the other person's facial expressions, body language constantly, as well as interacting with another person can be a very difficult thing and it can also lead to a lot of identity related issues kind of looking at yourself in the in the mirror you're not really seeing that you know the person who's inside sort of reflected sometimes that's an experience a lot of autistic people can have especially if you mask constantly if you have been masking constantly throughout your life and the NT expectations aspect of this is also an interesting one i think it's seen a lot when it comes to dating and, and workplace experiences I imagine that a lot of people feel this this sort of desire to be normal, be normal, to be neuronormative, not be autistic. They compare themselves, they compare their state, the place that they are in life, what they've achieved so far, to people who aren't autistic, who have an easier time with these aspects of life and they don't have all of these other sort of co-occurring conditions that they have to manage. It can definitely get you down a lot and make you feel very depressed, especially in this current age, this current sort of social climate of hustle culture and a lot of different spaces online, as you can imagine. If you know what I'm talking about, you know, you know it. <laughs> but what about the symptoms of depression? You might feel sad, hopeless, worried, and in children it may come across as being quite irritable. Anhedonia, which is the absolute bane of my existence, basically having no enjoyment or interest in things that you're doing. It's quite a common thing for me. A lot of the time I tend to be quite a workhorse. Quite often the things that would usually bring me joy and relax me and be interesting to me, like playing some video games or something, do not, it does not hold a very high reward in my brain. And so it's almost the same, on the same level as me doing work. So it's like, I just, nine times out of 10, I'd just rather do some work. I mean, I have to consider other factors like my overall energy levels, you know, burnout, things like that. But in general, like it can be a real issue for like just enjoying life in in some form. Ease of frustration. Some people can get very frustrated and irritable quite easily. Can have changes in appetite, either increasing your appetite or reducing it. I find that when it's quite mild or moderate in terms of severity, I tend to eat a lot. But if it gets really, really bad, I hardly eat at all. A lot of issues with sleep and I'd really highlight this because sleep can have a real impact on someone's mood. I'd really highly recommend checking out the previous podcast that I did with Dr. Megan Neff from Neurodivergent Insights. We talked all about autism and sleep. We also have low energy and fatigue. Your brain's sort of in this depressed state and so you don't feel as much motivation to go and do things, you might feel quite sluggish. Your concentration, your ability to make decisions, your, your sort of memory might be hampered a little bit. That's kind of related to this idea of executive dysfunction, which is a component of autism. It's also a component of depression. That executive dis dysfunction sort of impacts in your ability to sort of take care of your hygiene and, and keep yourself on track and time keep and organize yourself might go down if you're in a bad spell of depression. Could have issues in the bedroom related to erectile dysfunction, and that can happen for both men and women. It's also related to libido. It can also be related to like different other sort of sexual changes. Although I put it at last, I think it can have a pretty large impact on someone's self-esteem as well. Even though it might just seem like kind of a sort of a, a transient sort of not, not too important side effect to focus on, it can have some real impact on people. And of course, um, thoughts of self-harm and SUI. I'm not going to say the full words because I know it can be quite like, <laughs> it can uh, produce some feelings when, when people say it and also YouTube doesn't like it. 
but I'm sure you can imagine what the full word of that acronym is. So let's have a look at some of the differences and symptoms, because this is not just a, an episode, a presentation about depression. We're going to be talking about autism and how it may be different for autistic people. This is going to come from my personal experience, because I don't think there's been a lot of research goes in, going into like the difference in like how the symptoms come on, but I have noticed some some things in my life. My functioning tends to drop sooner in more atypical ways than how it may drop for other people. The most difficult for me, thing for me, thing for me, is executive function. Those sort of life management skills, basically. I struggle with that a lot. And so it generally is the first thing to drop when my severity increases. My social difficulties, I'm not too bad socializing. I don't experience a lot of social anxiety. I'm pretty good with it. It doesn't cause me much issues, but my social battery can be quite low. So my tolerance for interaction or my desire for interaction might be a bit lower than your average person. And so that will drop off next. And the anhedonia, the not enjoying things, tends to come last. And that, those are sort of three aspects that can be a little bit different with me. Some is like a compounding variable to, you know, the, the issues that I have due to being autistic around executive dysfunction sort of amplified by being depressed. I also find that I have an increased need for routine and certainty, but I have a lot of difficulties maintaining it when my severity gets bad. When my executive function diminishes, it can be really hard to maintain it, but it's important that I do. My meltdown, shutdown, and spells of mutism, sort of related sensitivities to, to, to all of those things, may increase during bad spells of depression. So my tolerance for sensory social things might drop quite a bit. The likelihood that I might get overwhelmed emotionally might increase. Isolation tends to come pretty pretty close second to those executive dysfunction issues. I isolate myself. I stop talking to people because I don't have the capacity to do so. It does have some negative impacts on me and I do try to maintain it to a reasonable degree, but it can be a difficulty for me. Lots of negative rumination. I know that a lot of people, autistic people that I've talked to, tend to be very introspective, tend to think a lot about lots of different concepts, about their special interests, about everything really. Because I'm such a natural sort of in, internal thinker, introspective thinker, it quickly turns into lots and lots and lots of negative rumination. And you may be asking, hey Thomas, like all of this is seeming, seeming very similar. I've heard about a concept of autistic burnouts, but I'm not too sure. I mean, is it depression? Is it autistic burnout? God, who who knows? <laughs> autistic burnout can cause depression, and I think also depression can contribute to autistic burnout. The differences and overlap make it incredibly difficult to isolate as a concept, but I do think that Megan Neff, the person I was talking about in terms of sleep, the last podcast that we did, does do a great job at that, and I do have a graphic that they produce on the next slide. I think in general, it doesn't really matter when it comes to recovery in my personal experience, as burnout almost always exacerbates my existing depression. The reasons for why I might develop one or the other might be different, might be a lot more related to sort of my energy expenditure in the burnout aspect, might be related to my sensory sort of social exposure with the burnout. Very hard to kind of pick apart and separate the two, I understand, but let's have a look at Megan Neff's graphic here. It's a bit hard to see on here. <laughs> Tell you what, I'll add this in post. Hide that for a second. Oh, that's me. You have depression on the left side and autistic burnout on the right side. The overlap there would be the food and appetite changes, the social withdrawal, interpersonal decision-making, concentration difficulties, tearfulness, so sort of emotional sensitivity becoming emotionally sort of dysregulated a lot more easily. Executive dysfunction issues, of course, a sense of emptiness and, and perhaps a very, very strong feeling of fatigue. But there can be some differences. I think when it comes to comparing depression to burnout, I think we've already covered sort of depression. Let's talk about things that you, you see more often when it comes to burnout as opposed to depression. Behavioral activation and burnout may be a bit dif different for autistic people. So excessive activity, exacerbate said burnout. It doesn't always exacerbate depression. Sensory sensitivities will increase quite a bit for autistic people. I would argue the same sort of with myself experiencing depression that can also happen. 
but perhaps in the context of this, it might be a bit more applicable. Sort of the, the benefits of rest and unmasking can be a lot more apparent to sort of dealing with autistic burnout. So things like self-care, sensory support, sensory relief, um, unmasking, sort of trying to remove that mask and sort of becoming your authentic autistic self might be a lot more beneficial. Loss of ability to mask. So if you do mask quite often, you might find that if you are going for a burnout, you can't do it as well as you usually would be able to. You can't hide your autism as much. Could have some loss of skills related to executive dysfunction, communication, and life skills. I'd say you could also experience that with depression, but I do think that perhaps the communication aspect might be a bit more apparent. Non-existence ideation. So you might want the demands of life, these sensory inputs, to stop, sometimes leading to daydreaming of sort of not being around rather than sort of ideation of your actual sort of ending yourself. It might just be a feeling of, I just don't want to be here. This is too much rather than I really want to do this. I want to end everything. A lot of subtle differences between the two. Obviously it's going to be heavily very subjective in either case and sort of separating the two concepts. It's quite a difficult job, quite a difficult thing. But I think this can sort of give perhaps a little bit of an insight of how to sort of discern between the two. Recovery. Hooray. Trying to get back to normal. How do you do so? <laughs> God, I don't know. It's not the easiest. And um, if you come across anyone who says it's easy if you follow this step by step method and it's just going to be seamless and flawless, they're probably lying because that's just not what mental health is like. It varies so much person to person day-to-day -day severity to severity that the saying that everything is just going to get better in a linear fashion is a very silly thing to do but there is a lot of things that you can actually do to help yourself out number one being always engage with a doctor or psychotherapist it might take you a while to actually find somebody who is good for you who understands you who does actually benefit you in recovery but it's very very important because if you don't have the resources available, like the emergency numbers to call, if you don't have some support going on, it might be quite difficult to actually get yourself out of that period. And it might snowball if you don't tackle it to some degree. It doesn't mean you go full force, full into like daily, you know, three hour sessions of psychotherapy, but at least doing something to try and combat this I think is is a very ideal thing to do and it's worth highlighting that you want to take baby steps in all of these areas usually what happens when you get very very depressed when I get very very depressed and severe all my functioning goes I can't do anything I'm in bed I'm staring at the ceiling watching paint dry literally dissociated out of my brain listening to sad music you know not being able to get up do anything not wanting to get up and get a drink of water or eat or anything like that. It can be a really horrific condition to deal with. So taking baby steps to getting back to your normal levels of functioning, you want to you wanna have something to work towards, but you don't want to put too much pressure on yourself. So focus on the day. Do not focus on the week. Do not focus on the month. Do not focus on the time that you've not, not been spending at optimal performance in terms of your working life. Do not focus on that. Focus on the day. What can you do today? If you are not in work, if you're taking time off work due to your mental health, build a routine. Even if you aren't at work, fill it with something, something positive for you. It could be as simple as in the morning or in the afternoon, or whenever you wake up, going outside, spending five minutes on, on the front porch or the back porch or in your garden, taking a walk, doing a little bit of exercise in, in your home, doing some meditation. It could be doing a bit of journaling about your thoughts. There's a lot of constructive things that you can do and trying to embed some semblance of a routine that's that's reasonable for you to be able to do in the state will kind of keep the ball rolling and it will reduce your anxiety a lot and it'll help you feel a lot more hopeful and confident in yourself of sort of getting yourself out of this really difficult period. Greater care must be taken when it comes to socializing. I know this was something that was highlighted as a strictly autistic burnout thing but it can also be something related to depression as well. Although it can be hard, you want to get some in. Whatever way feels comfortable to you. If you've got a friend that can come over, have a chat and a coffee for about 15 minutes, great. If you can go out for a little bit, you can go out into public for a little bit, 
do that. Try and try and reduce that that sense of stress, the anxiety from that change if you haven't been doing it for a while by using sensory supports, by taking breaks in socializing. It could be something as simple as having a phone call or texting with somebody. Even if you feel like you don't want to and you feel like everyone hates you and they're only they're just getting upset at you and annoyed at you because you're in this this state. I understand all of those thoughts. But try and put yourself first, keeping on top of your hydration when you're out and about, keeping on top of your food, making sure that you're not absolutely energy depleted when you're like going out for a walk or going out in public, making sure that you've got enough sleep. Um, I know that for me, when I'm depressed, I tend to sleep a lot. So it's not really an issue for me, but perhaps there might be an issue of oversleeping. So I might want to try and reduce the amount of time that I'm spent in a voluntary comatose state. And so let's have a look at some of the therapy and medications. As I said, I am not a doctor. I'm just an autistic man who has done a lot of reading and had a lot of experience with depression myself. Therapy, CBT or counselling can be relatively more ineffective for autistic people. In my experience, that aspect of alexithymia that I talked about in a previous video can really get in the way of both me processing events that have that are causing me difficulty processing emotions because I can't always recognize that they're there and sort of tie them to events that I'm experiencing. So actually going into therapy and processing those things is very, very difficult without some kind of alternative way of sort of baiting those emotions out of me. And the flat effects um, can really you know, sort of this idea of autistic people not really showing as a much emotional expression. You know, we might say things, we might say how we're feeling, but we may not express it on the outside in terms of our facial expressions, our body language. And that's not really an issue for over communicating with other autistic people. But for neurotypicals, they may very much undermine what you're saying to them if it doesn't appear that, that way on the outside. So they might, they might have some kind of like cognitive dissonance between what you're telling them about how you're feeling and the way that you look. It might be hard to relate with most therapists, of course, they're not autistic. In most cases, they don't really understand what being autistic is like. They don't have much lived experience, kind of perspectives on autism. And there can be a lot of miscommunication during in during and in therapy you can get infantilization happening sometimes where you might go into a doctor they may know they may know that you're autistic and you start talking to them and they almost undermine your experiences your thoughts and opinions and tell you what the problem is <laughs> you know they know that you're autistic so they bring up a lot of autism related things which you know good for them but might not be applicable to you and if they're not willing to sort of listen to you as an adult and take you seriously when, you, when you're talking to them, it's going to be very, very difficult to get some proper, like, helpful therapy out of it. My suggestion is find a neurodivergent therapist or someone with heavy experience with both the medical and socio-political worlds of autism. Very difficult to find. You might have to do it online. It might be quite expensive. Really depends on who and where you are. Generally, this is not something that you can get on general healthcare from my experience. And I've spent lots and lots of time myself over the years trying to find a therapist who would be able to work with me, who would be able to actually support me. It's very, very difficult to find one, but there are people out there. One of the things that's talked about a lot when it comes to therapy and autistic people is dialectical behavior therapy, DBT rather than CBT. So it's a type of talking therapy that is based on CBT, but is adapted to those who feel emotions intensely. CBT generally has the outcomes of changing your thinking patterns and therefore your behaviors. Whereas DBT sort of aims to change how you interact with the world as you are, rather than the way that you think. You know, you're a different brain, you're a different person, you're autistic, and sometimes Asking you to change your perceptions and your thinking patterns is more akin to this idea of masking and it just may not be as applicable to us. And how to manage the negative emotions and situations that may come from you being so different. Sounds like I'm talking down to you. <laughs> you being so different, you. So yeah, it's kind of this, this approach of both accepting and changing your behaviours simultaneously. Focusing on both the present and the future rather than the past, like how you would do usually with CBT to sort of process 
memories and, and things of that nature. As I said, again, not a doctor. You're a doctor. You got any resources? Post them down in the comments. <laughs> Just trying to give some some options, some sort of roots of research and reading that you could go into if you are currently struggling with depression. Medication. Uh, again, not a doctor. Highlighting that many, many times throughout this because this is a very mental health related thing. And I'm not a psychotherapist. I'm not a doctor. Autistic people, from what I've seen, can be more sensitive. And I heard this from Dr. Temple Grandin in our podcast. They take a very, very low dose of SSRIs because too much can cause oversensitivity and a lot of anxiety in them. For me, it does tend to ramp up my anxiety a fair bit, especially with SSRIs. It tends to help my depression a fair bit, my mood stabilization. But when it comes to anxiety, it skyrockets it. And, and I have to take other medications to sedate me in order to cope with the overstimulation that I experience with SSRIs. It's a whole mess. I'm going to make a video on autism and medications soon, sort of an inside the Altiverse kind of edition video. Um, so if you do want to check that out, it's my, my own experience with meds, probably give a bit more of a in-depth view into this from a lived experience perspective. Medications can also have paradoxical reactions. So there's one study that I saw where they looked at the impact of benzodiazepines, which are basically these GABA agonist medications. They basically sort of suppress and inhibit your neural activity and sort of make you feel a lot more calm and less anxious. In some autistic people, it raises their anxiety. I'd say that outside of meds, there's a lot of use in trying to fix certain life circumstances if that's what's impacted your current emotional state, your current experience of depression, there are long-term side effects, there are short-term side effects, a lot of bad things, perhaps some unseen things that we haven't really characterized. If it's going to sort of save you from tipping over that edge, I think it's worthwhile considering them with a doctor. There are also over-the-counter things that you can get supplements, things like that, which is generally suggested to be given to people who have more of a mild experience of depression. Things like St. John's where seeing other stuff like use of saffron, you know, 5-HTP, which is this sort of precursor molecule to serotonin, various other supplements, omega freeze, magnesium for anxiety, you know, there's, there's all, all sorts of different things which are available, but I definitely, even in those cases, talk to your doctor about it. And especially if you are on other medications, because sometimes these things can interact with those meds. So be aware of that. So some of the lessons from my depression, just some of the things that I do really want to highlight from my own experiences. As I said, I'm a very lived experience based channel. So I have severe periods and usually these exist alongside burnout. It's a difficult thing. It just happens to me at least once or twice a year. Most of the time I sit around mild to moderate levels of depression. Sometimes it dips quite a bit, quite considerably. All my functioning goes. It's not seasonal affective disorder because it's not always related to the season, you know, whether there's a lot of daylight or not. Over the years I've been trying to accept that that's just something that's going to happen and sometimes I'm not going to be able to do as much work as I want to do, be as productive. And I just have to find ways to sort of um, temper myself, not make myself feel too bad for when those things happen. Most of my experiences with meds come from SSRIs. I've tried fluoxetine, I've tried sertraline, which was awful. I hated sertraline. Uh, fluoxetine made me feel like a psychopath. Uh, the one that I've landed on is citalopram, which does come with side effects, the anxiety being one. And uh, metazapine is one thing that I take, which helps me curb those anxiety feelings that I get from SSRIs. You know, it helps with sleep, sort of helps with my gut a little bit as well. It has been spiking up my appetite quite a bit and it can definitely contribute towards like binge eating disorder. So it's worthwhile to be aware of that if your doctor's considering using this. The gym, even in severe periods, it could be anything from getting activity, getting outside, has been massively helpful for me maintaining my mental health. And even if it doesn't really have much effect on my mental health. I think just having something that I can do when I'm not functioning very well just sort of makes me feel like I'm making progress in some area. Around two to three small in social interactions per week usually does, does me quite good. It varies from week to week. And, you know, obviously sometimes I might have one weekend where I spend a lot of time socializing. 
never awakens when I when I don't, and I just have little calls with my friends and my loved ones. It fits in with my social battery being a bit lower, but it also um, sort of helps me combat feelings of loneliness. And really talking to people about what's been going on sometimes can do a lot for you, just like processing what's happening at the moment. Omega-3, as I said before, and CBD helps me a lot when it comes to anxiety. I'd say that also, I don't know, I feel I feel like when it comes to magnesium, magnesium helps me a lot when it comes to anxiety too. It's horrible to be depressed, but to be both very depressed and very anxious, it's a whole different kettle of fish, and just trying to manage one of those can sometimes be quite helpful. And I'd say probably the biggest thing that has helped me stay alive, stay here, sort of maintain a level of functioning, maintain a level of motivation, is finding a goal. It's finding some kind of meaning stays with you and it's sort of a, a, a goal that's outside of yourself, that's external, which kind of helps you continue on even at your worst periods, you know, if you're feeling absolutely awful. It doesn't matter. You've got a meaning, you know, there's a meaning to all of it. it kind of makes you feel a bit more comfortable that, you know, you can get through this and you can continue working towards your goal and meaning can sometimes be, well, I mean, it has been probably the most helpful thing for me. And gratitude. I'm not saying go out there and get a gratitude journal and do it all the time, but now and again, just try and think about like things that you are grateful for. It's not going to have a massive positive impact on you, but I found that generally just being practicing, being thankful can sometimes alleviate some of those feelings of hopelessness, you know, kind of offset it just a little bit. I'm not, I don't want to go into that toxically positive kind of severe things, but Little things like that added up, like all of these different strategies added up, generally help me maintain my functioning and maintain my mental health at a reasonable level. And you've got to remember that dealing with depression, managing depression, learning to live with depression is a long-term thing. And there's going to be ups and downs, and there's going to be mistakes, and it's going to be a lot of trial and error. But over time, you will learn to process and deal with these thoughts and feelings. When my severe periods come around now, I'm a lot more equipped to keeping myself sane. I've got a lot of things that I do in order to sort of cut back on work and sort of focus on my own sort of mental health, which has been helpful. And a lot of different ways of thinking about it and a lot of, you know, having that meaning sort of existing within me can, can really help me sort of through those really dark periods. It's a very long term thing and it's not a quick fix, sadly. And I'd say even to a certain extent, it doesn't get easier. It's just you learn to, to manage it better. Sounds horrible. It's kind of like a, like a hopeless thing. I think it can get easier for some people. It really depends. Um, for me, it doesn't get any easier. But, you know, I, I still want... I, I've got to a place in my life that I processed it enough. I can manage it enough that I, st I want to be here. You know, my, my family and my friends and... My work is, is important enough to me that it offsets the difficulty that life can offer me sometimes. You know, if you have been experiencing it for a long period of time, the likely is, likelihood is, is it's not going to go away with a flick of the switch, but the way that you combat it, the way that you manage it might change over time. And life might just get a little bit easier, especially during those low parts. Final thoughts. More needs to be done to protect autistic people from bullying, discrimination, a use, and make crime. Two things that I haven't really delved into much during this, but if I did, it'd probably be a very, very long video. These are big contributors to someone's mental health, their anxiety, and therefore their likelihood with depression. So I think this is definitely something that we need to focus on a lot more. Helping include autistic people in the school system or the workplace. I think those can all those would all have a very positive impact on the lives, the well being of autistic people. We also need more well trained professionals who specialise in psychotherapy for autistic adults. There is a big gap. There is such a big gap between <laughs> sort of the prevalence of of depression and mental illness among autistic people and the amount of resources available to actually deal with that. We need more research into the reason for these depression occurrences. Is it something that's genetic? I would argue it's probably not all genetic. I think there's a lot of that social emotional factors which, which go into 
the development of depression amongst neurodivergent autistic individuals. Uh, but there may be some genetic links and just having a bit more research into why that's occurring, I think could do a lot for pushing for policies to um, help support autistic people. You know, if we isolate that it's not a genetic thing, that we're, we're not just more depressed on average because of being autistic, then perhaps we might be able to advocate more for changes in the actual structures that support autistic people. We need more inclusion training and practices within schools, universities, workplaces. A lot of people don't understand autism. A lot of people can't support autistic people. A lot of people have a lot of judgments which impact the social flourishing of autistic individuals just based on, you know, how people interpret our being the way that we are. They can all have real impacts on our social life, you know, contribute to those sort of feelings of isolation and loneliness, which definitely do plague the autistic community. So I don't want to leave this on a bad spot, but it's kind of hard when talking about depression. <laughs> it's a very intense thing. I hope that this has been helpful somewhat. Again, want to highlight a lot of the stuff that I've talked about today. Make sure to check it with someone who is qualified, a doctor, psych psychologist. I am not an all-seeing person. I have not, you know, taken the clinical textbooks and just planted it and sort of used it as sort of an educational resource. I've, I've mixed in a lot of different aspects of autistic lived experience and also my own opinions on, on a variety of topics. Take, take it as perhaps a, an, an ignition to sort of do your own research or talk to a doctor or talk to a psychotherapist about these things. If you have found this helpful, uh, please make sure to like and subscribe. Kind of one of those things helps me out a lot. And if you do want to support me doing things like this, my streams, my podcasts, my presentations, any support that you can give me in terms of memberships, you know, I've got lots of different tiers and the lowest tier is 99p a month. It's the lowest that I could put it. You get a lot of badges, emojis, you get access to a lot of uncut live streams that I do, as well as early access to any videos that I do make and put out. And if you are going through depression, my heart goes out to you. It's truly one of the most awful things and it's not the most relatable to a lot of people. If, you, if you're still here and you're looking for resources to help yourself out, good on you. Us people, us clinically depressed individuals, dysphymic, whatever you want to call it, we are the survivors. The fact that you are doing this, watching this video, um, trying to find ways to sort of get out of this or manage this depression, I think it's an incredibly admirable thing and I think it's amazing and it's an amazing thing to do for the people around you too. Anyway, I'm going to stop before I start to tear up and get a good old soppy and all that, but I hope you found this useful and I'll see you in another presentation very, very soon.